Hey, everybody. We're about to do a show. Thanks for watching. Eric, you ready? I am. Yes. Am I recording? Yes, I am. Here we go. I do, I do three snaps now before I, so it helps me find it when I do the editing. So do, I know it's a little beatnik. It is a little beatnik or maybe a little in living color. I don't know if you've ever yes. watched it. Yes, <laughs> a little in living color. <laughs> Welcome aboard the Daily Tech News Show. Please keep your earbuds in at all times. If throughout the show you feel the need to contribute, go to patreon.com slash acedetect. Now, please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 22nd, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Eric Franklin, section editor for How To and Tablets at CNET and host of The Fix. The yeah. Fix is in, Eric. <laughs> All right, good. That's good. That, that puts in everything in my favor, right? That's right, man. You're doing a great job. I'm, I, you know, I had a little something to do with some how-to videos at CNET back in the day, and I'm glad to see the uh, tradition carrying on strong. It's looking yes. awesome. Yes, I've taken up the uh, Tom Merritt mantle, and I'm running with it. No, I mean, no one could ever replace Tom Merritt. But thank you for the compliment. No, no, it's looking good. Uh, folks should check it out at cnet.com slash how-2. Uh, but we have got some headlines to talk about. We're going to get into uh, talking a little bit about the new iPads and the tablet market in general. But let's start off with the headlines. Recode reports Twitter unveiled a developer toolkit called Fabric at Flight. Flight is the company's first mobile developers conference. Fabric has three main parts. Crashlytics SDK, which helps devs fix any app's stability. It doesn't have to be a Twitter-related app. Uh, then there's the Mopub SDK, which helps devs implement Twitter's Mopub advertising in apps. Of course, that's going to make Twitter a little money. And the Twitter SDK, which, as you might expect, allows things like Twitter posts to be embedded in apps, but also has a password-free authentication mechanism called Digits that a lot of people were saying Twitter wants to use to get rid of the password. Password. Uh, rather than use a Twitter account, Digits can you create an account for any service. Doesn't have to. It's not authenticating through Twitter, and the uh, service is authenticated using only a phone number. So it's kind of like Snapchat or WhatsApp or any of those. It's only going to be good for mobile, Eric. But this is this is pretty interesting. That Twitter's like, you know, we're just going to do this for the wider good because we think it'll come back to us. You think that's why they're doing it? I mean, is that is that the only motivation that you can see behind it, or? That's what they say. And and yeah. and honestly, like why make it available for anything outside of Twitter if that if you weren't just hoping, oh well, if people use this, hopefully that'll start having good effects for us down the road. I mean, so, any anybody uh, wants to get rid of passwords, man, I'm all for them. I'm all for it too. I just don't know what that world looks like, you know, cuz I've only lived in a world of passwords for the last 20 years, you know. So I'm not sure how <laughs> How, you know, when so, you've only known passwords, how can you live in a world without passwords? I know, it seems inconceivable. You're absolutely right. Because before the 20 years, there was no internet. So I had, you know, I don't know, only passwords I ever used were, you know, game passwords on my Sega Master System. Sure. You know, play old video games. <laughs> Cheat codes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Game Genie. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, it's... Uh, I, and obviously, you know, making your phone number be your password on a mobile device pretty much only works on a mobile device. Uh, and there, there are issues with security there that we could talk through, but, but it's yeah. a start. I like it. Yeah, no, it's a start. That's, I mean, the whole security thing is my only concern about that. I'm curious to see where it goes. Google has a new email app called Inbox from the same people who built the Gmail app. TechCrunch reports that the Inbox app is designed to present information from your email in a helpful context because it shares similar features with Google Now. Inbox features include bundles, a way to group similar types of email together, things like receipts or highlights, uh, which flags the user to upcoming events and all those links to articles your mom sends you, as well as reminders, assists, and snoozes which uh, I, that's a big factor in a lot of uh, mail apps these days. Best of all, it's available cross-platform uh, as an app for iOS, on the web, in the Chrome browser, and on Android. But you have to be invited in. Did you get invited in, Eric? I don't know if I've gotten invited in. It, it, who, who invites you? Well, you have to email inbox at google.com to ask for an invite. And okay. then I guess if you get in, maybe you'll have invites you could hand out to your friends. I feel like they do this a lot. They did this with Google Plus. It was this whole like, oh, yeah. invited. I think it makes the the, the whole platform a little bit um, a little bit more sought after and exciting. 
what do you think about this? I, I feel like they tried to do this with their, uh, like, what was it, uh, primary uh, inbox a few years ago. Right, uh, I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't really worked for me. I pretty much ignore almost everything that comes into my Gmail uh, personal account because it's just so much stuff coming in. You know, I actually find the social and promotions tabs, which are the default tabs, mostly useful. Uh, and, and, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't care if they went away. I just kind of forget there. I'm always like, Oh, I got to check that other tab. Yeah. Uh, but, but for the most part, uh, they don't do much for me. So this, I almost don't want it to be too smart. I want to, I want to keep my inbox at zero. I want to keep it empty, not uh, use it as a task well, list. To see the day my, my <laughs> inbox could stay at zero, you know, like I always clean it out every few months and I'm like, all right. I'm gonna do this every every email that comes in. I'm gonna vet it and check it and delete it and whatever I have to do with it. But then after a while, it's just after a weekend. Like I come back and there's a thousand messages there. I'm not going through all those. Yeah, and because one of the things inbox can do is change things into tasks, and it almost feels like they're encouraging bad behavior of just like ah, we give up. Use your email as a task list. Yeah, <laughs> You're all exactly. doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> The next web reports Microsoft released the final build of its Connect SDK 2.0 for Windows. For the first time, developers can publish Connect apps to the Windows Store and sell them. Uh, the second generation Connect for Windows was released back in July, if you missed that. Microsoft also announced a $50 adapter kit, which can make the Xbox version of the Connect work with Windows. So if you're one of those early Xbox One purchasers and you're stuck with a Connect and you're angry because they now sell them without it, you could. Uh -huh. Spend fifty more dollars on it and make it work with your Windows machine. Oh man! I, you know, can we for a second talk about just Microsoft and the Xbox One and the whole? You know, I was really I, this is a little bit off topic, but I was really excited about when they first announced that thing. I was so excited about it. I was like, oh, I can gift games or let people borrow my games digitally. It was. It sounded really cool. Sounded great. And then everyone just. I didn't understand why people were so angry. I didn't get it. I literally, I, like, I'm not a Microsoft fanboy or anything like that, but I didn't understand the anger behind it. And it just, you know, it just kept building and building until finally, like, we'll do whatever you want. Just please buy this thing, you know? Well, and I think what happened particularly is Matrick left. Matrick yeah. brought all those features in for people like you, and he yeah. got all this hate from people not like you, <laughs> uh, and then he left. And so yeah. Microsoft was like, well, there seem to be more not Eric Franklin's than Eric Franklin's, so let's yeah. change. I'm sure uh, someone said that in a meeting. Yeah, uh, that's probably, yes, yeah. that's how they refer to them at Microsoft. I'm, yeah. I'm told by but, people familiar with the matter. Yeah, but this, I mean, the uh, Connect uh, SDK 2.0 sounds exciting. I feel like on the PC, most people are doing, like, they're hacking, you know, yeah. stuff together, really cool stuff. I'm excited to see what they can do with 2.0, what, you know, with the advantages that that tech that hardware has over the first uh, iteration. Yeah, absolutely. Those of you waiting for the first Apple Pay glitch can relax now or get excited if you're a hater, I guess. Uh, Bloomberg reports that about 1,000 transactions made with Apple Pay were mistakenly duplicated, a processing mistake between Bank of America and one payment network, not Apple, was to blame, according to a person familiar with the matter. A Bank of America spokeswoman apologized and said the company was correcting the mistake immediately. So no harm done, really. Right, right. Tech, TechCrunch reports on an app called PhotoMath from Microblink that can take a picture of a math problem and deliver the steps for solving it. Now, while the app could be very attractive to math students, obviously, Microblink says it does not want to get into the education market. It just wants to show off what its machine vision technology can do. That's pretty impressive. The company provides ready-to-use SDKs for particular use cases, things like bill payments or equation solving. Um, but I think that I could prove, showing my work, that students are going to find this demo very compelling and want to have this app. <laughs> No, for sure. I feel like uh, Gus Van Sant's going to have to go back and, and remake uh, Google Hunting. Like that scene where he has that huge math problem and he goes and solves it. You know, there's just, just a scene of him taking a picture of it. You know? Yeah, there's a kid that's like, I got it. It's right here. I have yeah. the photo math app, so done. He yeah. was just from the future. That's that's the whole, that's the new Man, ending. I, right. High school me is look is right now going, I desperately want this app. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. The Verge reports Apple's Tim Cook and Chinese Vice Premier Mei Kai met today. The Xinhua news agency says the pair exchanged views on protection of users' information 
and, quote, strengthening cooperation in information and communication fields. Pretty sure those words are mostly meaningless. Uh, no mention was made of the iCloud attacks alleged to be coming from within China, although Apple has acknowledged, quote, intermittent organized network attacks. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg is also in Beijing to visit Tsinghua University, where he has been appointed a member of the School of Economics and Management's advisory board. Tim Cook already a member of that board, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. Good company, I guess, Tim. TechCrunch reports Xiaomi's Hugo Barra announced the company will migrate international user data to servers outside of China. Barra believes the migration could cut network request latency for users in India by up to 350 milliseconds and help users in Malaysia experience two to three times faster Mi Cloud photo sync. Xiaomi brings in a large part of its revenue from software services, if you didn't realize that. Mi UI services will be housed in Amazon AWS data centers in Oregon and Singapore with more local locations being considered as they bring the services to other markets like Brazil, for instance. Samsung and Barnes & Noble are teaming up again with a tablet called the Galaxy Tab 4 Nook 10.1, because that's a snappy name. <laughs> According to Engadget, it's essentially the same build and design as the Galaxy Tab 4, but it has the Barnes & Noble apps, the Nook library, the Nook shop, $199 after instant rebate, and includes $200 worth of free book-related content. So depending if that's book-related content you wanted, you could consider that free. Sure, right. Um, yeah, I think they did this with the seven-inch version as well. I think it's just a way for you know Barnes and Noble to keep the Nook brand alive because they no longer have a Nook tablet, so you got to do it some way. Yeah, they're, I, I think they're saying we like the Nook idea. We didn't yeah. like having to build all the stuff. Right, we didn't like losing money. Yeah. Tablets, so. Yeah. <laughs> Time for some news from you. Uh, these are particular stories that were submitted to our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We have stories all through the headlines that are submitted to the subreddit. It's one of the things I look at when I determine what stories are going to go in the show. But I always pick a few to highlight uh, that are particularly of interest to the audience. So get in there and vote, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. UTech blogger, UK tech blogger, sent us a New York Times article about the Hungarian government's desire to tax the internet. The draft bill in the Hungarian parliament would tax internet providers 154 ints, that's about 60 US cents, per gigabyte of data traffic. The economic minister says it will raise up to $20 billion in revenue. I bet it will. Fixed line internet traffic in Hungary was 1.15 billion gigabytes in 2013, plus another 18 million in mobile internet, which is more like 175 billion forints. So maybe there's going to be a cap on the total amount. Either way, Hungarian citizens are not happy, as you might expect, and have planned a rally on Sunday outside the economic ministry, which they organized on Facebook while the bites are less expensive. Nice. <laughs> That's good. good for them. Gold Kick submitted the CNET story about several companies demonstrating one gigabit per second or faster internet service over DSL. This was done at the Broadband World Forum in Amsterdam this week. Broadcom, Triductor Technology in China, and Scipio out of Israel are making network equipment chips that support something called G.Fast that enables faster DSL speeds. Network equipment would need to be close to you, though, within 50 meters from a building to deliver its top speed. G.Fast service could arrive in homes beginning in 2016, although Telecom Austria has the tech working in real-world tests already. I feel like this is meant to bolster DSL while it's like, well, it's before it becomes totally obsolete. Like by the time 2016 rolls around, you'll have faster cable internet, you'll have faster fiber internet offerings, you'll have more fiber internet offerings. But companies who have DSL on the ground won't have to just retire it. They'll be able to say, well, we can still offer something. We can offer a gigabit. Well, yeah, and how, uh, you know, how ubiquitous is fiber going to be in 2016? Will it be in every city? Will it be in small towns? It means. Some people that maybe don't have access to fiber and still want fast internet and yeah. you know, want to be completely left out, this might be a good option. Yeah, because this cop because DSL at least in the U.S. and definitely in most places in Europe is is pervasive, right? It, yeah. It's all over the place. And finally, Battle Koalatsu submitted an Android Central report about some new Android apps from Microsoft Garage. That's a, a newer effort at Microsoft, kind of like Google's twenty percent time. You work on what you want. Uh, yes, I said Android apps, if you missed that, from Microsoft. Apps include Next Lock Screen, a notification lock screen, Journeys and Notes, a social travel app, Bing Torque, an app that launches a Bing search when you turn your wrist. 
So you don't have to say anything. You just what I always want it. <laughs> yeah. And finally, City Zen, an app to send information from the public to their local government to fix problems. That app only works for the Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation in India. But if you're in Hyderabad, that's pretty useful. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I imagine it would be. <laughs> I just love the idea that Satya Nadella's Microsoft really is like, yeah, we're just going to make stuff for people. Like, sure, we'll make Android apps. If they catch on and we can figure out how to make money off them, why not? Yeah. Let's do it. It's, it's smart business. Yeah. And that is a look at the headlines. All right. Uh, all over the place today iPad Air 2, iPad Mini 3 are shipping. People are opening them up. All the reviews are getting posted. You guys had uh, Scott Stein's review up there at CNET. Uh, yeah. it's, the good seems to be the processor. In fact, the benchmarks are through the roof. Uh, I don't know how much of a difference it really makes in practice, but the A8X processor is a star. Uh, you got the better camera. You got the anti-reflective screen. It's thinner. It's lighter. It's got Touch ID. Uh, the battery's kind of unchanged. It's not necessarily a negative, but it didn't get any better. Uh, and the audio playback, I know Scott was saying the audio playback makes it vibrate because it's so thin. Uh, oh, wow. you, you get a little resonance there. But this is probably the least exciting tablet release from Apple ever, just if you take the general, uh, the, the general temperature. Would you agree with that, Eric? Maybe. Uh, you know, like you said, the AX... A A8X processor is probably the most exciting thing. It's the thing that excites me the most because of the upgraded GPU, which means, you know, hopefully, you know, higher frame rates in, in games, in 3D games. Sure. Which is what I, you know, that's that's mostly what I do on my iPad. You know, it's mostly Hearthstone, so that's a 2D game. But, uh, you know... You don't need a bigger graphic processor to play Hearthstone, though. Well, do you? you don't need one. I'm but playing that on my I, my iPad 3. Okay, right. So, but if you play that on your iPad three, then you go over to your your fully rigged out PC. You definitely notice a difference. No, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. right. Stuff. And sometimes I have to say, when I'm playing on my iPad and I'm I'm, tr I'm trying to drag my finger across the screen, sometimes it doesn't work. And I end up I, hitting the wrong. Card. I've accidentally flame striked myself in the face. I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that happens. So, I mean, yes, it's probably not that exciting for most people. If you have an iPad Air already or even an iPad 4 or 3, I'm not even sure there's a reason to upgrade unless you want Touch ID. Now, Touch ID does mean that people can use Apple Pay, not the retail in-store version, but the, the kind of purchase in-app version without, you know, just using your, uh, your uh, the Touch ID and your fingerprint. So, I mean, that's that could be exciting for some. Me, personally, I... That would be cool, but I also I'm gonna have that on my iPhone six whenever that gets here. So I haven't gotten mine yet. Uh, so yeah, there isn't that much uh, to get excited about, to be honest. And that is not good news, particularly for Apple, but for the tablet market in general. When here here's the iPad sales numbers that we just got in the Apple earnings: twelve point three one million sales, down thirteen percent year over year. Now analysts expected it to be down, but they didn't expect it to be down that much. They thought it was going to be thirteen point four million. Uh, it's the worst quarter for iPad since Q two twenty twelve iPad revenue is down 14% year over year. So it's not like they're making more money selling fewer of them. Tablet sales in general are not good. Gartner, if you remember, we talked about this when we talked about the PC sales slowing uh, at, a, at a slower rate. Uh, Gartner projects tablet sales to rise only 11% worldwide in 2014. Last year, it rose 55%. That's a big slowing. Tablet penetration is about 40 to 50%. A lot of people are saying it's saturated. ABI research predicts an even worse rise in 2014. They're saying 2% rise in, uh, or 2.5% rise in 2014. So at best, you can say that the tablet market is stable, right? It's certainly not dying. It's still growing, yeah. but it's not growing the way phones are. And phones have, smartphones have been around a lot longer, um, even if you just date it back to the iPhone. But if you go back to Blackberries and Trios, you know, they certainly... We've had smartphones for more than a decade, if you look at it that way. On the other hand, tablets are newer, and they already reach stability. If you had, if you had to guess, Eric, what, what do you think is the cause of that? I mean, I think, you, I think you're on the right track, you know, mentioning smartphones. In my, in my opinion, it seems to me that smartphones, I think people are just realizing that, wait a minute, these smartphones are only getting better. They have just as many features. And also, I can make calls on them. In some in some cases, they actually have more features than the tablet version. 
uh, some of the Samsung ones. Um, and it's like, oh, I can get a six-inch <laughs> smartphone that I can make calls on. I can do all this, everything. I can pay. You know, I can use if I get an iPhone. I can use. Uh, uh, you know, I can pay. I can use uh, in, in retail stores. I don't need um, my wallet, whatever. I can't do that on the tablet. Can't do that with the new iPad. I just think that um, I think that people are kind of realizing I don't really need a tablet. I have this giant phone in my pocket anyway. I, well, look, yeah. Look at the Nexus Six. That's what five point nine three inches. Yeah. Like, it's effectively a tablet. Yeah, it is a know? tablet. A tablet, you know, by you know the Amazon uh, HD six is six inches. You know, it's a six inch screen. You know, it's the same same. It's the same size as the iPhone six plus. Same size as uh, the Nexus six. I, I just I don't feel like there's much of a need anymore. When you get close to ten inches, then it becomes like, is this my laptop replacement? But I but think, it's not, right? I, yeah, I think yeah. all of these yogas and stuff have proven like it, you can't you can't just replace a laptop with a tablet. You can't. They're they're not there yet. I don't. I mean, I imagine at some point we're gonna get to the point where the ARM processor is 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 good enough to compete with you know Intel Core i processors. We're not there yet, so. In the meantime, you can't do everything you want to do uh, on your tab you know, on a notebook with your tablet. So they're in this kind of midpoint where they're not as good as phones, not as good as laptops, and people are just questioning whether they actually need them or not. Yeah, I I mean I'll I'll try to phrase it more positively. I think there are uses for the tablet, right? Hearthstone being one of them, but there <laughs> there but there are others, right? There there are things you can use the tablet for. Uh, there are definitely business applications you can use it for. Uh, there are times like when I'm on an airplane, it's great for just entertaining myself, playing some games, watching some movies. Uh, so there are times when I can use it for productivity. Although I feel like I'm much more productive on a laptop. But I think the thought was in the past that oh, tablets will take over over for thin and light laptops. And I think people have realized, no, it really can't do that. At best, I might do a hybrid, but I won't give up that keyboard. And something like the Surface just hasn't quite cracked the, I'm gonna be a tablet and a keyboard at the, with a keyboard at the same time. Yeah. So tablets are still good for stuff, but they haven't replaced laptops the way some people thought they would. And I don't think anyone expected that phones would get to the point where they would be threatening the tablet at the smaller form factor size. Yeah. So their arena that we're in is more limited, right? No, for sure. I I think I mean you you're saying everything correctly. And uh, you know, I prob I'm probably not quite as positive as you. But you know, I I do understand that there are uses for tablet like you said. 21 21 million Hearthstone users out there. They all <laughs> that's what that's what tablets are for right now. Everyone's playing Hearthstone <laughs> on their tablet. But you know, you're right. Like I, I remember a few years ago, they were like, yeah, man, this is going to replace the laptop. And I get so many questions from relatives and just people who email in, hey, you know, is it, you know, what's what's the best tablet to replace my laptop? Can I do that? Is that a viable solution? And I think people want to be able to do that. They want to have this really thin touchscreen device they can take everywhere that's just as powerful as a laptop, which is, it's not the case. Here's Here's my hope. For tablets, I got two, I got two things. That if you're a tablet manufacturer out there listening, uh, enterprise Apple's partnering with IBM to sell tablets, and I think uh, lots of the Android tablet manufacturers are, do, are are looking at this too, where you can say, okay, there are these niches within enterprise where a tablet would be more cost effective. They're getting more powerful with things like the A8X processor, so we can use them in their enterprise, and that's that's where PCs made their money for so long was selling large amounts to the enterprise. I think tablets could do that and boost some sales. The other thing is the upgrade cycle with a tablet is not the same as a phone. That's so true. like I said, I'm using an iPad 3 uh, and it's fine. I haven't needed to buy an, a new iPad and this year I didn't see a need to buy a new iPad. So you're yeah. talking about a much longer upgrade cycle. That's going to slow things down eventually because you had everybody buying a tablet because they never had one and then keeping that tablet for a long time. My Nexus 7 is the original Nexus 7. It's just getting to the point where I'm like, ah, uh, it's a little slow, maybe this coming year, 2015, I'll need to buy a new seven inch tablet. Yeah. Uh, but eventually that balances out, right? Eventually you reach some stability where people say, oh, okay, yeah, my tablet is too old now. It's, it's too slow. And that, that will cause a floor to appear in the market, I think. Yeah, you're right. Like my wife has an iPad 3, absolutely will not, probably will have that for the next 10 years because all she does is stream video on it. That's literally all she does. And every, 
every app that's you know every app that she uses works on the iPad three, so there's no need for her to upgrade at all. Yeah, it's just it's kind of it's it's kind of disappointing because I really had high hopes for tablet tablets a few years ago, especially in the gaming space. But even there, I mean, you know, they're not making kind of huge leaps. They keep saying, "Oh, this is console quality graphics," but then you look at it, you're like, um, console ish. Yeah, console ish. If you only have two characters on screen, and you yeah. know that kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, little... want to finish up here with a, an email from Nick, who was in Australia. So he's one of the first people to get an iPad Air 2 uh, today. And he said, I'm upgrading from a long-in-the-tooth iPad 3rd gen. So the same one that I'm using. So the Air 2 is nice and light by comparison, but it's not amazing or magical or any of the other adjectives Apple may use to describe it. Going from the 3rd gen to the Air 2, I was surprised in a bad way about how hot the Air 2 gets on the right-hand side of the bezel, rather off-putting on something that I use as an internet appliance and not a hardcore gaming machine. Finally, it's basically what I expected in every other way. Just a faster iPad with Touch ID and Lightning, which is what I wanted. Yeah, so I, I guess he got what he wanted. <laughs> you know, that I'm pretty sure that that heat is probably coming from the, A8, the A8X processor. It's probably right underneath that. I'm not, I can't confirm that. It was probably right there. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's, that's a, that, that email kind of uh, really exemplifies um, Apple's tablets right now. It's like you know what you're gonna get. You're not gonna get anything surprising. You're not gonna get anything magical if you're upgrading because ever since they went to the iPad 3 when they had the the what do you call it, the Retina display, it's really hard to see any other differences other than oh my app opened two seconds earlier than it used to or something yeah. like that, which isn't that big of a deal. And every once in a while I get a little lag, uh, but but for the most part it's usable. It's still it, it the Nexus 7 is slowing a little faster than the third gen iPad for me. Anyway. Okay. Let's take a look at the calendar. Sony Xperia Z3V comes to Verizon tomorrow for $200, only in black and white. But as long as you want black or white, you're going to be good. Tomorrow, earnings will be released for Microsoft, Amazon, and Pandora. And tomorrow, we have two conferences, Launch Scale in San Francisco, emceed by Jason Calcanis, and Pop Tech, which is a gathering of tech-minded thinkers in Camden, Maine. Our pick of the day comes from Byron in L.A., he wanted to turn us on to an audio recording application uh, he just learned about a couple of months ago called PreSonus Studio One. It's P-R-E-S-O-N-U-S, in case I'm saying it wrong. It's a professional digital audio workstation for both Windows and Mac. Comes in a variety of paid versions, starting at 100 bucks. But the version that I'm most excited about is the free version, he says. For 30 days, you can try out the professional version, which costs $399, still cheaper than Pro Tools, and comes with the Melodyne tuning plug-in and a mastering suite. After 30 days, it becomes a more limited free version that is still quite functional. I've been using the free Audacity program for years, but I've always wished it could do live effects processing, but unfortunately it can't. I've also used GarageBand, but it has its own limitations as well, namely 24-bit recording at 44.1 kilohertz. Studio One Free lets you record unlimited tracks with higher bit rates and sample rates, if your interface supports them, and it includes nine plug-in effects. The only thing missing from the free version that I wish it had is a compressor and gate, but it's still pretty darn good without it, especially for free. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes, presonus.com, look for uh, Studio One. I'm, I, I'm always a supporter of the open source software before because I'm like, well, if, hopefully somebody will code these plugins, but this sounds like a pretty good deal for free. Yeah, I mean, to be able to use it at $400 piece of software for free with yeah. you know, limited functionality, not a bad deal. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep them coming, folks. We've been uh, we've been getting them. If you haven't heard yours yet on the show, don't worry. We, we're stockpiling them. you got some good stuff. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks for my picks. Uh, and a few emails. Uh, we were talking about YubiKey uh, as far as Google's second factor authentication. And Ari wanted to point out in the name of fairness, there is another UTF compliant manufacturer out there. There are several actually, especially since UTF is an open standard. Being a one manufacturer trick pony would make the whole open standard meaningless. For example, he says, Plug Up International offers readily available products as FIDO UTF security key. The physical construction seems weaker, which probably explains some of the cheaper price, still seems to be about the same as a cheaper USB flash drive. On the other hand, Yubico stuff is nearly indestructible, so you get what you pay for. However, I think the price 
price is an important factor. Plug up costs only $5.99 in Amazon. Yubico's $17.99 makes price mass adoption impossible. I don't know if it makes it impossible, but I get your point. More people are going to buy something at $6 than $18. He says, the stick is simply too expensive for anyone, but the security enthusiast techies like me and corporate security clients, at $6, it's much easier to see many general internet users who have a Google account getting one from Amazon just to be on the safe side of things. Eric, have you gone two-factor authentication on your, on your Google? Should I say yes? Should I answer? Yes, you totally did because that's what everyone should do. Well, yeah. I, it, it's not just two-factor authentication. It's... It's doing the uh, the authenticator app versus this YubiKey thing that they're now making available. So you don't even have to find the code and type it in. You just put right. the USB key. Do you think $18 is that much of a dissuasion to people? I guess for mass adoption, he's got a point. I think a lot of people will definitely balk at that price. Yeah. I mean, look, I had no problem uh, with Netflix when Netflix raised her prices, but people were up in arms about that, man. And it didn't seem like a big deal to me. So, like, Eighteen dollars doesn't seem like the big that big of a deal, but I know there's a lot of people out there that's gonna they're just gonna I don't wanna pay that just on principle, you know. Yeah. Why would I pay that much? It you you'll you won't regret it, but at the same time if you can get one for six dollars, then maybe you right. should get two of those and it's still cheaper. That way if right. one breaks, you yeah. still got another one. <laughs> Rich from lovely Cleveland uh, pointed out Google's addition to Play Music All Access service actually made him consider paying for the service. He says, I work at a college radio station in Cleveland, so access to music is never an issue. But with all that variety, it makes discovery and curation all the more important. I'm a huge songs of fan because their playlists are excellent. They are human curated, so they really have a great flow. Yes, it's easy to make a decent feeling good in the 90s mix, the soundtrack to Sunday morning waffle making endeavors, but the quality is consistent as you get more granular. Example, the super sad true love story somehow makes a transition from Beck to Sinatra to Jens Lechman work or Space Age Bachelor Pad going seamlessly from Dave Brubeck to Herp Albert to Sven Liebeck, which I don't even know how to pronounce that. The concierge would be gimmicky if it didn't work so well, but in general, it's excellent, even if it doesn't tend to go a little broad, or it does tend to go a little broad. Drilling down into some of the more specific playlists is half the fun. My only complaint was no offline listening, which means songs that stays at home. But with all access letting you cue it for offline listening, it's finally a viable choice for working in the car. So he's saying now that it's part of Google All Access, he can actually use it. It's kind of a killer feature for the service, in my opinion. Of course, the question will be, how can Google let people know about it? Clearly, Songza was having an issue with that, or their subscriber base would have been bigger. Rich says, not employed by Songza, although I wouldn't mind if I was. So if you need to contact Rich Songza, let me know. He's looking for a job. Uh, otherwise, he really likes your service. Have you? What do you use for music? That's such a good question, man. I was thinking about that as you were reading that. I'm such an old man, man. I don't listen. You know what I listen to? Cassettes. I listen to I listen to movie soundtracks, and I listen to like really obscure old like uh, rock from the '70s. But like, do you just use your phone and and you download MP3s? I use my phone. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, okay. I, I'll, I'll go to I, I go to iTunes, man. And I'll usually buy the album. Like I last album I bought was the Guardians of the Galaxy score. Not even the soundtrack. I bought that too, but the last album I bought was the Guardians of the Galaxy score. So you're not the, talking about the feel-good cassette tape. You're talking about the the well, orchestral. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. it was Tyler Bates did that one. Uh, it was it's awesome. I love it, and it just it like when I listen to it, I think about uh, some of the scenes in the movie that I really like. It's just kind of a way to kind of you know remember that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say while I'm walking home, whatever. So I, like so I don't really have a need for all this other kind of stuff. I kind of dabbled into. I did a segment on the fix a few months ago about music services and then I was like, oh let me check these out these are really cool I didn't know they had all these features but then I just kind of forgot about it after that I just don't have a need for it I See, just for the first a few weeks ago I just heard that song what is it uh fancy Iggy Iggy oh, Azalea. Yeah, Iggy Azalea I had no idea who she was I yeah. had no idea who she was and next thing you know I was like oh this so, yeah this song's been out for a year it's really popular I don't she's know got an amazing story she like just like tricked her mom into sending her to the U.S. and then like worked as a waitress for a couple of years Good for her, man. Yeah. That's, that's a great Americans, well, and I guess Australian success. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? Like, maybe this is, maybe you should go check out the Songza thing or the Google All Access thing and see if there's like a soundtrack to your life playlist that'll catch your life. <laughs> I don't know what that would be. That would be like uh, maybe uh, the, the intro to Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> 
and maybe the, the, some of the music from The Wire, because those are those are the two See, things I love the you most. You should work for Songza. Because <laughs> yeah. I want to hear that playlist. It's yeah, amazing. That's awesome, Mike. I mean, pretty good. All right, folks. Eric Franklin, you got to go check out The Fix at cnet.com slash how dash two. Uh, look for the tablet coverage there that Eric uh, oversees as section editor. You can follow him on Twitter, twitter.com slash nidopal. It's N-I-D-O-P-A-L. Uh, anything coming up on The Fix you can tease or anything else you want to let folks know about? Well, um, we are teasing. Oh, well, I mean, we are in kind of the holiday season, so expect maybe something around that theme coming up you know mm -hmm. some, some do it yourselves or do it yourselves or uh, how to's and how to's uh, for the fix um yeah and maybe maybe you know people like using their cameras a lot it would be great to support that with an episode as well just saying i don't know if that's coming but that would be great if it was your complete guide to ios 8.1 is already up there yeah. Uh, if you yeah. need that. So yeah, check that out that, as well. That would be great. Check that out. Thanks, man. It's good to have you on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. It was fun. And thank you to our patrons, 4,459 folks helping us reach our next contributor goal. We are $45 away from being halfway there. So if 45 of you just decided to give us a buck a month, we'd be halfway to getting Justin Robert Young as a regular contributor. Check it out. At patreon.com slash ace to tech, you can find all the ways to support the show at dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. Don't forget you have a voice in what stories we cover. If you're like, I don't got money to give you merit, just go vote. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let us know what you want to hear us talk about. Email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 51259 daily. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Nate Langson, editor of Wired UK Online and Ars Technica UK and host of the Wired UK podcast. And we might also have a report on the hoverboard. Talk to you then. visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Done. Wow, I had no idea it was a Frog Pants Studio uh, production. Oh, yeah. I, I've been listening to um, Scott's uh, Diablo 3 podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot lately. Uh, it's really good. It's just, it's just him. Yeah, Which I, I kind of like that. I like kinda, some, I sometimes kind of like that style for a podcast when it's just one dude just talking. It's um, the Scully it, podcasting model. Exactly, right? Like, it takes a talent to pull that off. I know Dan Carlin does it really well. Yeah. Uh, Scott does it really well, but yeah, not, yeah. not everybody can do that. Yeah, not everyone can pull that off. Sure. Go listen yeah. to a really early, um, like, episode one or two of The Real Deal to see exactly how hard it can be. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Oh man! Do you still, um, do you, I guess I'm, I'm assuming you hang out with him and still talk to him, and like you guys are still with Rafe? No, no, uh, with uh, Scott. Scott Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah. No, Scott and I host a, a show called Current Geek on Fridays, um, oh. which is just kind of a wrap up of oh, Geek yeah, Times of the Week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're we're still doing that, and I have him on DTNS from time to time. I do a regular thing on the morning stream, this right. morning morning show. Uh, did that this morning actually. So yeah, cool. No, I'm loving I'm loving uh, the Frog Pants universe. Are you going to BlizzCon? I am. Are you? No, no, I've never been, and I don't know if I need to go at this point. I like I don't. I'm there was a time when I was like I, I really want to go. And I yeah. Was, and stuff. It was back when I was really knee deep in WoW uh, stuff, and then I stopped playing WoW for a few years. Uh, even though I just resub just to check out Warlords. Oh yeah, the uh, Warlords is looking really good actually. Yeah, and the new patch came out last week, so I want to check right. that out. Uh, but I'm just gonna do the uh, what do you call it? the um, the day the virtual ticket. The virtual ticket, yeah. Yeah, I used to do that when I lived in San Francisco. I went down one time, and it was a lot of fun to be there. Mm -hmm. But I get it. Like I'm going because I can drive. It's you know, yeah. it's like it's, yeah. it's so much easier yeah. um, than if I had to fly and all that. So right, yeah, it's a little bit more. Awesome. But yeah, we'll be doing talk about frog pants. Uh, the a AIE Guild has an a, has a, an entire room uh, that they set aside, the Guild Hall. Really? Yeah, it's always awesome. 
it's like just a great place to kind of take a break and relax. That's cool. That's really cool. I, yeah, I feel like maybe I need to go to BlizzCon at some point. Just yeah, to, if you could swing it one at least once, it'd be cool just yeah. to, just to see it. But it's like yeah. But I, I, I hear you. Like I used to get the virtual ticket and I'd, I'd feel like, oh, without hurting my feet, I can enjoy everything. And you actually do yeah. see more when you do it that way. Yeah, I've heard because, that too. Yeah. Yeah, because you're not like moving around and trying to get from place to place and all that. You're just on your couch. I even was like walking my dog, listening to it on Slingbox one year. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> see, yeah. that's, that's the kind of stuff. You know, I... I went to E3 last, was it last year? Uh, I hadn't gone in like 12 years before that. And that was a good experience to go. I, you know, I helped CNET cover E3 of uh, that last year in 2013. Mm -hmm. But I did feel like I missed a lot of stuff. <laughs> I think Patrick Beja's iPad may have showed up. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's what it is. It's the. Uh... Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that yeah. Screen, or that was that a doorbell? No, I think that was. That was an actual. Just dog. the dogs <laughs> reacting to somebody coming to the door. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just feel like um, with those kind of shows, I I enjoy them more when I'm not there. Yeah, CES is the same way for me. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get like, to see much, to be honest. What's that? You just don't get to see as much, uh, especially if no. you're covering it. It's, yeah, it's I cool. find that I do better coverage when I'm not there. Yeah, I'm sure you do. The, the thing is, like, you, it's harder to get guests because they have to get internet. Sure. But, uh, but otherwise, yeah. you know, like you have more time to just relax. You have good internet. You're not fighting for internet. So. Yeah. I'm fighting for internet. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, by the way, I can confirm there was a package at the door. <laughs> is it Patrick? Is it for, well, it probably has my name on it, but yeah, it looks, Patrick. it looks very iPad esque or ish. What's your, uh, what's your current association with uh, Patrick Beja? I've never met him. I just, you know, I heard him on many Frog Pants uh, podcasts. Oh, yeah. Um, Patrick, uh, we uh, brought him on uh, in September as a weekly contributor. Oh, so so cool. once a week he's he's like locked in as a guest host. Is he still at Blizzard? Wasn't he at Blizzard for a while? He is leaving. Yeah, he's going to become an independent uh, podcaster now. Oh, good for him. Yeah. So at BlizzCon, like he's still technically employed by them right now, although it's all known. Uh, but yeah, at BlizzCon, he's coming to BlizzCon after his last day. So he'll be able to be at BlizzCon and enjoy not being oh, employed. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. That's and awesome. And I'm sensing that this is the year you should actually come to BlizzCon. It seems like, you know, you are a frog pantsy person and you would like to meet all these frog pantsy people and they'll all be there in one convenient location. I'm just You're saying. right. I probably should have come this year. I just, I couldn't make, it's the same thing with Comic-Con. It's like always, Every same Comic Con, um, uh, Evo, Evolution, the fighting game tournament that happens every year. Every year I experience it. I'm like, all right, next year I'm going. Next year I'm going. Mm -hmm. I just, and when it comes around to them, it's like, eh, I don't really want to deal with it. Uh, yeah, so I think you're right, but I'm just being lazy. Oh, well, maybe next year. Maybe. By the way, I'm just going right for Are You With the Inbox Crowd? Yeah. By Big Jim. Yep, absolutely. As our title. That's good. Well done. It was like pretty, it. we have a, a tool called Showbot, uh, Eric, at showbot.replex.org, where people can submit titles from within the chat room and then vote on them. And it was pretty wide. There wasn't like a favorite today. So I'm just picking one. That's a good one. That's a yeah. very, uh, you know, very much in the stylings of Tom Merritt right there. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, so I just hang out. I just hang out live until I'm done editing, um, exporting right now. So you can go whenever you need to, Eric. If, okay. Yeah. You're welcome to I hang out too. It's either one. I should probably get back to this how-to section. Yeah. Um, at some point. Well, well hey, you were great. Work, yeah, you were great on the show, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, you know, uh, thanks for having me again. Um, I always appreciate. Every time I'm on one of your shows. Uh, 
And I was like, oh, they'll never have me back. And then you, a few months later, you're like, oh, I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. No, you're great, man. I don't know why you think that. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, it's fun. No, it's this fun. is really good. We'll definitely have you back whenever you, whenever you want. Okay, cool. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Uh, all right. Um, I guess that's all the housekeeping we need to do. Yeah, I think we're good. Cool. Bye, Jenny. Nice to meet you. Bye. It was nice to meet you. Tell everybody right. I said hey. I will. All right. See you guys. Bye. Is ah, that like thank you, Beatmaster. When you were a pioneer in the 18-whatevers and somebody would come out for a visit from Boston and then go home to the home base, and you're like, remember when it was like that? Like somebody visiting CNET, visiting Independentville. Maybe I'm taking the metaphor too far. but I love Wild West <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> Maybe I read too many Laura Ingalls Wilder books. So like, wait, so Eric is from Boston and he's coming out where? To the, to the west? Wild West. To the Wild West, okay. Yeah. The independent Wild West. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm with right. you now. And you're like, well, that, you know, I don't know. I, I always think about that, like when I see people from my old job and mm -hmm. this, like the, the or either of my old major jobs, like the very civilized yet constricted thing. Well, and Eric is one of the guys I got to know really quickly when I started at CNET because he and Molly were friends. Right. So, you know, I was like, I, I feel like he and I go way back. Well, I guess we do yeah. go way back. You do go way yeah. back. But. Yeah, but it's just, it's so interesting. Like, it's like visions of the past in a weird way. It mm -hmm. always strikes me like the big, the big old Papa Company or Mama Company or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chew on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm in a philosophical mood. Um, it's the uh, it's the slightly gray tone to the sunlight today. Puts yes, you, yes. Put you in a musing, amusing mood. mood. Um, but yeah, he was great. No, Eric's awesome. I don't he's know why like, he, he says that every time too. He's like, "Oh, I wasn't sure you'd." Want me. I'm like, mm. "I don't like people. I like people who have one ounce of humble." What can yeah, I say? Yeah, yeah, totally. The other version that I, you know, I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I'll be honest, he gets better every time. He's never bad, he's but great. like every time, he's he's even more like engaged yeah. and. Well, know, he's got good. the goods. You can he does tell. exactly. And so it's just a matter of being comfortable. You can always tell. Got the goods. Um. I'm exporting. Am I done exporting? I can't be done exporting. Oh my God, wait, what did I do? Something is wrong. Something is wrong on my computer. Oh, right, it just frizzles for a second. Oh, it actually worked. I don't know why I thought that. Okay. I'm going to upload and then we'll be done. I'm going to upload. I feel like things take me longer lately, but oh. I don't know why. I'm just getting old. I sl I think I was sick. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm sick anymore, but like I slept 10 hours last night. Wow. That is like borderline. And I woke up feeling like good, Right. which the past couple of days I'd woke up really sleepy and woozy. And I like, I woke up at 7 a.m. I was like, I feel great. Yeah. Feel normal. So. so that's like that's like you were fighting something in your exactly. body. Exactly. I think it was it. low level, like not right. not super crazy, but I've created now the Frog Pants Wild West. <laughs> the Frontier Town. Oh, new version of SoundCloud just became available. Please reload your page. Oh boy. And start everything you just did over again. <laughs> That's all right. So you could throw that uh, box that came in the pile of Patrick Beja boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I like how he's shipping everything. I probably should shouldn't out him on that, should I? The customs will come for him. Oh right. Uh, There's nothing in the box. You mean all of the gifts that I am giving him? The gifts, the nice gifts. Such nice gifts. Which he won't be taxed for either. <laughs> Uh, okay. Weird. SoundCloud's acting weird. Come on, SoundCloud. Get it together. There's an almond coffee in my future. <laughs> oh, is it, are we, are we going almond coffee? 
I was really sad last time that my practical limitations prevented on the copy. All right, I'm in. You folks uh, need to learn the ways of the almond coffee if you have coffee. I'm not usually one for flavored coffee either, by the way. Like, no, I'm not a pumpkin about- spice latte fan. But this place, which is not Starbucks, right. has amazing almond lattes. It's not it too sweet or over like the top. Flavoring. Yeah. It tastes like actual almond, like the way that almond extract makes a cake taste. That's right. And I think that's like. because they're using almond extract. Yeah. I don't but think like, they're using like, like some fake syrup or something. Because if you use too much almond extract, it tastes like bitter poison. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Did you see what Big Jim wrote in the chat room? <laughs> Sheriff Johnson? <laughs> no, no. Oh. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know what you mean. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I, 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 should, I will only implicate myself if I say anything. <laughs> We're now going to say nothing. <laughs> oh, it's time for another Air New Zealand uh, epic safety video starring the Battle of the Five Armies. This is my oh, favorite time of the year. Okay, so we got a new Lord one. of the Rings movie promotion comes out. Did you out. see the Virgin Atlantic one? Yes. By the yes. way, hilarious. Was this a dance one? No, it was five yeah, hours one? and 46 minutes long. It's what? like what your flight is like if you're not on Virgin Atlantic, and it's a bunch of dummies in what is very obviously a United <laughs> Airlines plane. I don't know where they got it. <laughs> That's awesome. I have to check that out. Yeah. Did they like buy an, a, a plane just to do that? That's my that guess thing. is there was a retired. Right. My here's my guess. My guess is there is a retired United Airlines plane out that is available graveyard. for you to shoot movies and TV yeah. shows, and they got. Have it you that ever one. been to the airplane graveyard out in the Mojave? No, I've heard about it. I've never. Have you been? It, yeah, because that's where space. Maybe I heard about uh, it from you, actually. Well, that's where Space One launched. Oh, okay. Right, like literally right next to the airplane graveyard, and um, I'll never forget it. It's so creepy and awesome. It's yeah, just a bunch of the, sad, big old sad airplanes sitting there in the desert. Uh, restart the backup. Everything's just being weird. Stop it. Now, freaking uh, WordPress is being all wonky. Hmm. Bizarre. Like my mother. How bizarre. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. Uh, There's part of Google All Access. <laughs> okay. I believe I'm done with the post. All Somebody right. called those sad words when I say I'm out of the post. Um, all right. Because it means goodbye. So it's OVA over. So today I will give you an extra special look at a Diablo coaster. I don't know. It's not that. It's all I had. It's all I had close by. All right. All right I'm going. I'm going into the post. All right. I'm. Um, what about this? Right here. When they laid us all off at Tech TV. They gave us this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we could remember May 2004 is when it all ended. Aww. And hit ourselves in the head with this. All right. Goodbye. Bye, Internet. See you later.